Hi guys, this is Dan Croucher, Field Application Specialist with Photometrics, and today I'm going to talk about light sheet microscopy. So firstly, let's set out what the challenges are of conventional light microscopy so we know what we need from a microscope. Life is full of dynamic processes, so in order to visualize them, we need to image live cells or organisms. So the first thing we want to do is avoid photo bleaching and photo damage to live samples so we can be sure that the processes we're following occur in healthy living cells. We also want to capture these dynamic processes in three dimensions because things don't happen just in a single focal plane. Samples aren't all the same size, so we need to be able to image varied sample sizes as well as image them from various viewing positions. Finally, we want to minimize out-of-focus fluorescence for good optical sectioning. The problem is that conventional microscopy on cover slips isn't so compatible with live samples. There's no way we can squash a zebrafish under a cover slip, not without it being dead anyway, which defeats the object of seeing live processes. Cover slips also reduce our ability to freely position the sample. Another problem with conventional microscopy is that high intensity light is used to illuminate the sample, but this excites all fluorophores in the light path, not just the plane of interest. The result is that light emitted from outside the focal plane contributes to the image. By illuminating the entire sample with light, we also cause heating and photo damage, neither of which is particularly good for imaging live processes in a natural environment. Confocal microscopy overcomes one of the weaknesses of wide field microscopy by using pinholes to selectively collect light only from the plane of interest, which eliminates out of focus fluorescence. But high intensity light still penetrates through the entire sample, which still causes photo bleaching and photo damage. So what are our goals for light sheet? We want to minimize bleaching and reduce photo damage to the sample so we can image the sample for longer. We don't want to kill it, we want to keep it healthy for as long as we can. We want to image the dynamic 3D processes that occur in the whole organism. We want to image large, living, three-dimensional samples without squishing them. We want to 3D position that sample in three dimensions, including rotation. And we want to eliminate out-of-focus fluorescence for good optical sectioning. So the first thing we want to look at is how we get the light in to achieve that. With epifluorescence, we use the same objective for illumination and detection. We illuminate the whole sample, then detect the fluorescence back through the same objective. What we do with light sheet illumination instead is to introduce the light from the side, and then we image at the focal overlap, so that's where we get our detection from. So we're not illuminating the whole sample with light anymore, we're just illuminating the plane we're interested in. With epi-illumination, the whole sample is subjected to fluorescence illumination, so even when we're imaging just one z-section, like in confocal microscopy, the whole sample is being bleached and damaged. Whereas in light sheet illumination, you only illuminate the z-section that you're imaging. This is especially valuable in large samples, where multiple z-sections are necessary to build up three-dimensional image. In confocal, this would result in a lot of excess photo damage, which is completely avoided in light sheet illumination. So how do we do that? We do that by decoupling the illumination and detection paths. So this is where the excitation beam is coming in through this objective on the side. This objective generates our light sheet. And at a 90 degree angle to the illumination, that's where we have our detection objective. We form the sheet by using a cylindrical lens in the light path, which causes the beam to converge in the middle and diverge out again. This is the basic idea of a light sheet. So as the light comes out of the illumination objective, we make it so this part of the beam, what we call the beam waste, is in the middle of the sample, forming a sheet of light through it. This image shows the effect of the light sheet from above when it's passed through the sample. So the beam of light comes in from the left, the beam waste is nicely in the centre of the sample, and the fluorescence is detected through the detection objective above. That's how we form the sheet. Next we want to look at how we mount the sample to take full advantage of the light sheet. And the way that we most commonly do that is by mounting the sample vertically in a hydrogel. It's ideal for larger living specimens because you can keep them in natural conditions with the right medium and buffers. It's also quite easy to repair and store using common laboratory materials. One of the best things about it though is that it translates and rotates really nicely. Easy positioning in X and Y, then you can just move it through the light sheet to generate Z stacks and rotate it to give multiple viewing positions. There are, generally speaking, three ways of mounting the sample in a conventional light sheet system, and I'll say now for the first time, but definitely not the last time, a light sheet system is designed around the sample. You want to know your sample first, and then build or buy your light sheet system around that. The first part of that decision is deciding how the sample needs to be mounted. The first method is hanging. 
It tends to come in a hooked, glued, clamped or suspended method. This is probably the least common mount that you'll see on conventional light sheet systems. The second method is embedded, so that would typically be in a syringe or a glass capillary, and this method is reasonably common. The final method is enclosed, and this is in FEP tubing, polymer foil or an agarose beaker. This is probably the most common mounting position for most light sheet samples, but really as I said, the sample dictates how it needs to be mounted. There's one more mounting method that I need to cover before we move on, and that is optical clearing. Obviously not every sample is nice and transparent. Light sheet works best the more transparent the sample is, because you want to get the light to penetrate all the way through for even illumination. Something like this, for example, is quite opaque, which is why methods like optical clearing were introduced to make these samples compatible with light sheet. Essentially, optical clearing is a chemical tissue treatment that renders fixed tissue samples optically transparent. The problem with this, obviously, is that it's not live imaging. You can't do this and keep the sample alive. These are a couple of the most well-known methods, scale and clarity. You can see in this image of the clarity method by the Dysroth lab, an opaque mouse brain was made into a clear transparent tissue that retains the structural features of the mouse brain, which allows us to perform structural studies on previously opaque tissues. So this is a chart from a recent Hoiskin paper detailing the best way to mount certain sample types. For example, zebrafish here are typically enclosed in FEP tubes or used in agarose cylinders, whereas C. elegans would be viewed on cover slips. The examples here don't cover the entire library of light sheet samples, mostly because light sheet is in constant development and new methods to image new model organisms are still published quite regularly, but it's great that resources like this exist to help scientists find the best mounting method for the sample they're interested in. So moving on to the sample chamber. A typical light sheet sample chamber will look something like this, a cube where the sample can be introduced from above. The chamber can be made both air and water tight, ensuring physiological conditions are maintained within it. So if a sample wants to be at 37 degrees, the chamber can be made to 37 degrees. The light sheet is introduced from the side as shown here, illuminating the sample through the middle, and a water dipping detection objective squeezes in through this circular opening that is then made watertight to preserve the conditions within the chamber. The sample can then be moved in X, Y, Z and rotated. To generate Z stacks in a light sheet system, you simply move the sample through the light sheet beam. The effect is that you only detect fluorescence from the area illuminated by the light sheet, and by adjusting the width of the beam waist, you can get larger step sizes or smaller. It all comes down to the sample and what is necessary to image. The smaller the step size, the longer the experiment will take, and the more data will be acquired, but higher resolution images will be obtained. But if you don't need that resolution, it could be worth using a thicker beam and less steps to cut down on time and data. Rotation adds an extra advantage to the light sheet system because now we can take image stacks from different angles on the same sample. We could take one when the sample is here in front of the objective, and another after 90 degrees, then a further 90 degrees, and so on. This gives us complementary information from different viewing angles which increases resolution. It's also possible if you have one z-stack from one rotational angle and another z-stack from another rotational angle to register and fuse them together to give a much higher resolution image than the originals. In this example, we can see the benefits of using rotational views to image the dorsal, lateral and ventral views of a fruit fly as it undergoes gastrulation. Being able to image multiple angles like this tells us more about how the sample undergoes dynamic live processes than imaging from just one side alone. But light sheet microscopy is not without its limitations. What we've been discussing up to now has been a single-sided illumination, where the light sheet has been coming in from one direction and forming the sheet in the middle of the sample. The problem is, as the light sheet comes in and hits the sample, you get refraction, scattering and absorption of light, which means that in this diagram, the image would look really nice on the left-hand side, but on the right-hand side, the beam has already started diverging out, reducing image quality. Another notable issue in light sheet, or really in all light microscopy, but relevant to light sheet because we can actually do something about it, is shadowing. Because where there is light, there are shadows. You can see in this image of a zebrafish embryo that because the light sheet comes from the left, there are shadows form that stretch across the image. This is where the light sheet hits more optically dense structures here that hinder the passage of light behind them, meaning that the parts of the sample within the shadow aren't being properly illuminated. You can see what I mean more clearly in this diagram where the light sheet hits an optically dense part of the sample casting a shadow behind it. The fluorophore hidden behind the optically dense structure gets less illumination because of the effect of shadowing. But light sheet microscopy gives us the ability to do something about shadowing, and this is what we would call 
a multi-view light sheet. One method of doing this is to use a pivot scanner to rotate the light sheet up and down to allow the illumination to penetrate behind optically dense structures. For example, using the pivot scanner the light sheet is pivoted up and here the light sheet is pivoted down. The result is that the fluorophores behind optically dense structures now become illuminated. If we go back to the image of the zebrafish embryo, the results of the pivot scanning method are clear. There's now almost no shadowing present on the pivoted image. Another way of doing this is to use double-sided illumination, where a light sheet is introduced from both the left and right side of the sample at the same time to cover the area of poor image quality caused by light refraction, scattering, absorption and shadowing. Again, we can see that in the single-sided illumination image, the light sheet doesn't penetrate the entire zebrafish early embryo. The light sheet gets refracted and renders the other half blurry and patchy. But if a light sheet is introduced from both sides, almost even illumination of the embryo is achieved. Being able to overcome these drawbacks of conventional light microscopy is a really big advantage of light sheet microscopy, allowing us to collect even higher quality images than before. So this is a basic comparison chart between light sheet fluorescence microscopy and other conventional microscopy techniques like wide field, turf and confocal, put together by Harry Shroff. So in terms of te temporal resolution and imaging depth, light sheet is considered to be the best for 3D imaging. For photo bleaching and toxicity, it's the best for 3D and 4D imaging. The signal to noise ratio is high, and it's still a diffraction limited technique, but Z resolution is comparable to confocal. If we compare the lateral and axial resolution between wide field, light sheet, spim, and confocal, we can see that confocal has better lateral resolution at both 10x 0.3 and 40x 0.8. But if we look at axial resolution, this is where light sheet really shines, because by using a 10x objective, giving us the largest field of view of the sample, light sheet gives you about twice the axial resolution of confocal. Once you get up to 40x and you start looking at smaller things, confocal starts to give better results. But if we consider that one of the primary goals of light sheet is to image larger organisms, this really is the ideal position for the technique. Plus, even at 40x, a light sheet system, despite the slightly reduced resolution, will still have the huge improvement in photo bleaching and phototoxicity. So light sheet feels to us like quite a new technique, and it is in a way, but it was actually invented way back in 1903 by Ziedentop and Zygmondi, and they published what we would now call an ultramicroscope. It's an indirect slit illumination, and they used it for dark field, but you can see it's exactly the same as what I described earlier. The light comes in here on the left, passes through the lenses, and hits the illumination objective, which casts the light sheet onto the sample, and then you can detect it through the detection objective. So again, it's using the same decoupled illumination and detection objectives, but they were doing this back at the beginning of last century. Here you can see the beam path as well. It's exactly the same as I described earlier. You get the beam converging at the center and then diverging out again to form the light sheet in the center of the sample. But it was really the work of Jan Hoiskin and Ernst Stelzer back in 2004 that brought light sheet back. They created Selective Plane Illumination Microscopy, now shortened to SPIM, S-P-I-M. And you can see again, this is where the light sheet is coming in on the left, and there's the sample chamber and the sample suspended above it for full X, Y, Z and rotational movement. And there's the detection objective on the right, leading to the camera at the end. So let's talk about these objectives, because this really is the core of the light sheet system. The first thing to note about the objective that's not always obvious from typical light sheet diagrams and drawings, is that they're really close together. And that's the reason that the objectives that we mostly see in light sheet range from 2x to 40x, but not usually larger. The working distance of the detection objective has to reach the light sheet, and high magnification, high NA objectives, particularly oil immersion objectives, have a working distance far too short for that. We couldn't move the objectives closer together without them colliding in space. There are some 60x light sheet implementations, but people will mostly work from 2x to 40x. So this is how the beam is formed by the illumination objective. The thickness of the sheet, the beam waste, is what the resolution of a light sheet is based on. So the thinner you can make the light sheet, the better the resolution. The field of view is dictated by the detection objective, so the aim is to match them so the field of view of the detection objective matches the position of the beam waste. The thickness of the beam waste is controlled through the NA of the illumination objective. A high NA objective gives us a thin light sheet, but the field of view where the beam converges is really small. When using a low NA objective, the beam converges into a thicker sheet, but the field of view is much larger. 
So the difference between high NA and low NA is whether you want a thin sheet with a small field of view or a thick light sheet with a large field of view. This decision all comes down to the sample. If you have a large sample, you'll need a lower NA objective with a larger field of view, but with a small sample, you can get away with a smaller field of view and improve resolution with a thinner sheet. This is another nice chart that shows which objectives match well together. You'll notice that with the Olympus 10x objectives here, that although they are the same objective, the NA is different. This is because the NA of the illumination objective will be restricted optically to adjust the thickness of the light sheet. Again, this is a great resource because it tells you how others have used these pairs of objectives, so scientists looking to do similar work can easily find out how to replicate it. So let's move on now to have a look at the different arrangements of light sheet systems and how they've been used. Two lens spin is the one I've mentioned the most so far. It's the simplest implementation where the light sheet comes in through the illumination objective on the left and the fluorescence is detected by the detection objective at 90 degrees to it. Three lens beam is what I mentioned earlier where light sheets are introduced from both sides to overcome problems with refraction, scattering, absorption of light and shadowing. The pivot scanning method and the dual view method are both called m spin, multi-view spin. Next we have four lens spin, which introduces another detection pathway on the remaining side. This means two cameras imaging simultaneously to provide two views of the sample at the same time. This can be used to increase resolution by imaging the sample from two different angles, or to double the imaging speed if you're rotating the sample because now you only need to rotate it halfway to image every angle. The next technique is I-spin and Di-spin, which I'll go into more detail about later. And finally the ultramicroscope, which you may remember from the Zedentop from Zygmondi paper from 1903. So, fit the sample to the system. There are a vast amount of light sheet systems which you can investigate in this paper and I regret that I can't go over them all and only have time to cover the main ones. The reason why there are so many different light sheet systems is because people who build their own systems build them to fit their sample. By decoupling the illumination and detection paths, the, the microscope can be very flexibly arranged in space, which gives us an almost endless opportunity for customization. What this resource allows scientists to do is compare light sheet platforms to their chosen sample type and size to make a good decision about which light sheet system to build or buy. Although it's reasonably simple to build a light sheet microscope, the huge amount of variance can be intimidating for scientists looking to build one. But as long as you remember that the sample comes first, the system should do no more than you need it to do. I'm now going to go through some of the more popular light sheet system designs, many of which have already been commercialized, which speaks to how robust these systems are. The first one I want to talk about is DiSpin. This system was developed by Harry Schroff at the National Institutes of Health, and unlike many other systems, can be used with cover slip mounted samples. It's also quite high magnification for a light sheet system, making use of 40x objectives. One of the great things about this one, though, is that it's possible to build it yourself. Detailed instructions can be found in the paper here, which contains information about the necessary hardware, how to build the system, and software integration. The way the DiSpin works is very interesting. If we look at the image here top right, we can see that the light sheet is introduced by one of the objectives, and the other objective is used for detection. It doesn't matter that the objectives are at a 45 degree angle to the stage, the most important thing is that the objectives are at a 90 degree angle to each other. Now what I just described, where one objective introduces the light sheet and the other detects, is actually I-spin, not di-spin. Inverted spin, not dual view inverted spin. To make the system dual view, the objectives can be made to act both as illumination objectives and detection objectives. So for the first frame of data, objective A would introduce the light sheet and objective B would detect. Then they would switch, and for the second frame of data, objective B would introduce the light sheet and objective A would detect. They would then do this sequentially until the acquisition is completed. What this does is gives us another method of doing multi-view spin to overcome the shadowing problems of a single light sheet, but unlike the dual view method I mentioned before, in this setup we only need to use two objectives. The two views can then be fused together to improve resolution. Another system we should look at is the ultramicroscope. The ultramicroscope is used typically for big things, very large and optically cleared samples. The detection objective you can see here is a 2x which gives you cellular resolution. It has a huge 18mm field of view and up to a 10mm working distance, making it perfect for larger samples. You can see that the light sheet is formed here and is split to illuminate the sample both from the left and the right. 
What's good about it is that it's further split to have three light sheets coming in, so if you only choose to illuminate one side of the sample, you can still get three light sheets going through to overcome shadowing. If you decide to use the dual view, that gives you six light sheets, which gives you fantastic resolution through large samples, which tend to be more optically dense than smaller ones. The next system I want to talk about is OpenSpin. OpenSpin is a fantastic idea. It's a completely open source project that gives scientists all they need to know to build their own light sheet microscope. If you look on the left here, it gives you a parts list, how to assemble it with videos and image guides, how to operate it, and how to include extensions and modifications. There's a gallery of images taken on the system and it tells you who has already built an open spin if you're looking for help to build an open spin system for a common sample. It really is a great community. The open spin system looks like this. So here's the laser where the light comes in. It bounces off of these lenses onto the cylindrical lens which shapes the beam into a light sheet which goes into the sample chamber where the sample is mounted. The illumination comes in from the left and the detection objective is at a 90 degree angle to the sheet heading out onto the camera. It's hard to get an idea of scale here, but it's really compact. The entire thing can fit in a suitcase. What the creators say is that any scientist can build this. You just need to look at the OpenSpin website, follow the instructions, and anyone could do it. The instructions are well written, all the components can be bought or 3D printed, and it's completely open source with other scientists willing to help. One of the great things about it is how versatile it is. So this one is a typical single light sheet system, but it could be adapted to include a second light sheet coming in from the right hand side, changing it into a three lens spin system. You could also add another detection optic below the sample chamber and make it into a four lens spin. It's really versatile. I now want to move on to talk about a different type of light sheet entirely. Digitally scanned laser light sheet, DSLM. So everything up to now has been spin, selective plane illumination microscopy, where a single light sheet from one or two directions illuminates the sample. DSLM is a completely different type of light sheet. In this type of light sheet, the laser forms a small beam waste but scans it through the sample. So instead of having a large beam waste that spans the entire sample, they have a beam waste here and the laser is propagated to the right so it scans through the sample. It's great for optically dense samples and gives superior resolution for that. The problem is that it introduces a lot of out-of-focus light, because when you scan the beam through, this is the part that you're interested in, but there's all of this out-of-focus light coming from the beam shoulders. This isn't an issue in spin because the beam waist spans the entire sample, and the shoulders are outside, but in DSLM the shoulders are now illuminating the sample, which isn't so great. However, we can overcome this by taking advantage of the rolling shutter of a CMOS camera to create what we call a virtual pinhole. We only turn on the pixels of the camera that image the beam waste. So if you imagine that this is a CMOS sensor down here, this is where the beam waste is. So these are the active pixels that are turned on. So you can see that as the beam waste is scanned through the sample, the active pixels of the CMOS sensor are rolled along with it. What that does is cut out all of the out of focus light from the beam shoulders by only imaging what's in the beam waste. A virtual pinhole really is the perfect term for this because you're pinholing this area by only turning on certain lines of the camera sensor and rolling that across. The difference looks like this. So without scanning the laser across the sample you can clearly see where the beam waste is and where the shoulders are. But then if we scan the beam across the sample using the synchronized camera readout we get a much nicer higher contrast image. However, Although we aren't imaging the beam shoulders, they do still scan through the sample, which can introduce more photo damage than spin. But as I said, this is typically used for large samples where you can't get the entire sample into the beam waste of a spin setup, or if the sample is too optically dense to image all at once. It's a very specific implementation of light sheet and not nearly as common as spin. Another type of light sheet involves changing the properties of the beam itself. This is Bessel beam illumination. It's complicated to form the beam, but it's essentially a couple of extra lenses needed in the light path. A Gaussian beam is every beam I've spoken about so far. It has its brightest point in the middle, but has quite a wide profile. When put through a cylindrical lens, it converges and diverges, like in this image here. The Bessel beam, in contrast, has a much thinner profile that propagates much further. You can see the difference here in the size of the beam waist between the Gaussian beam and the Bessel beam. The Bessel beam is much longer, which means we can project it further across the sample, giving us effectively a longer light sheet. But what it comes with is these lobes, and they will illuminate out-of-focus regions on the sample, compromising the quality of the optical sectioning, 
degrading contrast and introducing photo damage to these regions. It's a trade-off to get a thin light sheet with a larger field of view. Vessel beams have made it possible to do the last type of light sheet I'll be talking through, lattice light sheet, which was developed by the Betsic lab. It's a type of light sheet that combines vessel beam illumination with structured illumination microscopy by creating a patterned vessel beam, which you can see here in boxes C and D. They essentially shoot the beam through a grid and create a lot of little vessel beams, which produces multiple thin light sheets. You get the twofold increase in resolution, like in structured illumination microscopy, but highly parallelized because of the multiple light sheets. This makes the system incredibly fast, which, with speeds of up to a thousand frames per second. The objectives in lattice light sheet microscopy are orientated very close together, with a 25x detection objective on the right and a special optics objective created for the lattice light sheet on the left. It's a very complex system, but unmatched in resolution and speed. I'd like to end this talk with a discussion of the biggest issue in light sheet microscopy at the moment, and that is data handling. Light sheet produces a lot of data. If you consider the large amount of different views that are taken, the rotations, the z-sections, the fusion and the deconvolution, that is so much data. Here's a comparison of the amount of data generated over 24 hours with different types of microscopes. So a laser scanning confocal will produce about 85 gigabytes, which is pretty significant. This though is spin with an EMC CD camera, which has a fairly small 262,000 pixel sensor size, but we're already up to 5 terabytes of data but SPIN with a 4.2 megapixel SCMOS camera produces 90 terabytes of data in the same amount of time, and that is by far the most commonly used camera type for light sheet. One iSPIN full chip SCMOS time course over one hour producing one volume per second produces two terabytes of data that takes two to three days to deconvolve. This is such an incredible amount of data. To deal with this amount of data, a dedicated pipeline to an analysis computer is necessary and then you need subsequent archiving to handle the data storage. You also need specialized software to view the data as typical image analysis software can't handle such large files. The issue for many scientists is that it's very difficult to delete data just in case it ends up useful. But how do you efficiently store that much data? That's a question we still can't fully answer. So in conclusion, light sheet fluorescence microscopy is a technique that only illuminates the plane of interest which allows us to collect information from a single plane to minimize photo bleaching and photo damage to the rest of the sample. By eliminating out of focus light in this way, lower light intensities can be used to excite the sample, which further contributes to the reduction in photo bleaching and photo damage. With light sheet microscopy, we can image for extended periods of time, and more exposures can be taken using light sheet techniques than any other form of fluorescence microscopy. Light sheet microscopy allows us to overcome issues of shadowing, providing higher quality data than conventional fluorescence microscopy techniques, but still suffer from this problem. Light sheet systems are designed around the sample, so a large variety of systems have been developed both privately and commercially to suit the needs of multiple different sample types. However, data handling remains the biggest challenge, and although things are being done now with data compression, there is still a lot more to be done. Thank you very much.